Content marketing research. How in the world do you start and what should you pay attention to? We'll cover those steps and how to establish content marketing business goals with Ashley Segura today on The Edge. Go! Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. Powered by your digital marketing pioneers, Site Strategics. This week's featured guest is Ashley Segura, co-founder at Top Hat Content. Now, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. This is Edge of the Web Radio. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. Every week, we bring you amazing guests to chat with about digital marketing trends uh, and news. We also unpack a key marketing topic for our digital marketing audience. Whether you're a part of an agency or part of a uh, firm or a freelancer, this show is is for you. So be sure to check out everything over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. The show is actually brought to you by our title sponsor, Site Strategics, uh, pioneers in the agile digital marketing methodology. Their core specialties are SEO, uh, technical SEO, content SEO, SEM, social media, as con- conversion rate optimization, as well as omni-channel media broadcasts, uh, part of which uh, you're seeing right now, so or listening to right now, as the case may be. So if you're interested in results-based marketing, go check them out at sitestrategics.com, or you can give us a call there at uh, 877-SEO for web. That's 877-736-4932. Some housekeeping on the show. Just want to make sure that you catch or you call Caught everyone uh, that we that we have uh, interviewed it just recently. Kevin Indig, uh, Jason Bernard, as well as Craig Campbell has some great interviews uh, uh, and some really in-depth com- uh, conversations there. Coming up, we're going to be talking to Carolyn Leiden, as well as Pedro Diaz. Uh, so if you're interested in being part of this show, drop us a note over at info at sitestrategics.com today, and uh, we'll reach out and connect and see uh, see if there's a there's a there there. Uh, set your reminders, too, uh, on, the, on, our vid- on our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we post our videos, and uh, be sure to check out Edge of the Web as we have a slew of content articles coming out of this podcast on a regular basis. All right. check. Make sure that you also check out our weekly news podcast dropping each and every Tuesday. Uh, and we're uh, rolling through the digital news with Morty Oberstein. And you never know what actually he's going to say. So uh, you want to jump in there and, and see... Uh, <laughs> you might want to play some bets, actually, <laughs> depending on what he he starts saying. Because uh, I think we had like uh, before before a minute uh, this last time he dropped something awkward that made us all pause. There, Jake. There's lots of extra editing with Morty. I <laughs> he, I, I do more work now <laughs> on the editing side of things, <laughs> but no, it's good. It is good. It and is, it is good. fun to bet. Absolutely. You know, I think we're about even at this point. I think so. He's listening to this. You know he's going to do something. <laughs> now he's going to start messing with us. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So that's the show. And uh, again, our, our podcasts come out each and every week, two times a week. Our interview podcast as well as our news of the week's podcast. So make sure you check both of them out and uh, give us some feedback as well, uh, seeing how we're doing, uh, because that's how we uh, float to the top of the algorithm. So with all that aside, let's meet this week's industry expert. Uh, her name is Ashley Segura, formerly Ashley Ward. Uh, and <laughs> I was just unfortunately reminded of that before the show. Ashley is actually an international speaker uh, and VP of operations and co-founder over at Top Hat Content, uh, a, a content uh, marketing agency. She, she has worked extensively uh, both in-house and with multiple agencies helping clients grow their business online. Ashley regularly teaches digital marketing workshops and speaks at industry confer- conferences like PubCon, Brighton SEO, Search Love, Digital Summit, Retail Global, and the prestigious SMS Sydney. So, uh, it's a fantastic uh, pr- a presenter, a wealth of information. She also co-authored a bo- uh, best-selling book, The Better Business Book V2, uh, and is a contributing writer to industry blogs such as Search Engine Journal and Authority Labs. So, Ashley, thanks for coming on the show again. And this is <laughs> this is this is, a, this is what was uh, unfortunately. It, we we talked to you, and uh, I forgot that I actually interviewed you before because you were a different person then. You were Ashley Ward. <laughs> hey, I mean, it was what three years ago now. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Well, we lots have changed. A lot of things have changed, and you got married. So congratulations. 
Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just going to own the old man card here. A little bit of <laughs> senility just crept in there. But we had a great conversation back in 2018, and we welcome you back. And you've been very busy uh, over the course of the last few years here. Uh, so congratulations on all that. But for those of you who don't know you, uh, share us, give us your bio in your own words. How, how did you come to content marketing? Certainly. Um, I actually got into content marketing back in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, I had a journalism background, and so content has always been where my heart and soul has been. And then when print started, nah, I shouldn't say started, when print really actually died out and everything was going online, I decided to make the switch. And instead of printing all of my articles and paper, putting them all online. And that's when I really started to understand the fundamentals of content, what makes people go from content piece to content piece. Um, I opened an agency. I worked at multiple agencies. I'm now in the fourth agency that I've owned and changed quite a bit to really narrow into offering content services that actually make a difference these days. Mm -hmm. uh, since 2011, content has changed so much. The competition of content has always been there, but how everyone's digesting it has definitely changed and continues to change. So um, now in 2021, I've been able to really narrow in and niche down on content services and um, content offerings that actually make a difference these days. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Uh, you mentioned the competition of content, um, and I, I do want to get into that, but th there's also the the user, the content, you know, the digital, the, the, I should say the new media audience has has changed from 2011. I mean, they're more savvy, they're, they're much more um, authentically driven now. So the game is no longer the glut of content ever and never should have been actually. But uh, you've, you've got, you've got a whole nother savvy audience out there that you have to engage and persuade, right? A hundred percent. And the way everyone's searching for information now has definitely changed in the past decade, even in the past couple of years. Hmm. Um, we've gone back and forth of, well, we need really short content because everyone wants quick answers. And then it was, we need really long content because people are taking the time on their phones, on their commute or in the afternoon or during work, and they actually are digesting the long content. That's and right. then it changed from how people are searching. They're putting long tail keywords in and then they're now they're asking full blown questions as yep. if they're talking to a friend. And so it, the atmosphere has changed drastically. We all have a friend in Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, boy, that's kind of creepy. Um, so uh, before anything else, uh, you're absolutely right. And I'd love to want to get into this. What does your job actually entail uh, right now? So right now I'm managing the agency. So it's pretty much anything and everything from business development, sales, uh, creating new products, refining products, working directly with clients, uh, a little bit of everything in the agency life, as well as speaking, teaching. Um, I do, I still do a lot of workshops, oh, cool. uh, a lot of educational pieces. Excellent. Excellent. So obviously with the shift of 2020 uh, into virtual workshops, how how do you uh, swim there? Were you able to seamlessly uh, transition and and uh, did you did you miss a beat there? Were things a little bit challenging or uh, did you dive right in? To be honest, uh, it wasn't that drastically different for me in particular and mm -hmm. for my agency. Um, I've been in a remote atmosphere for about five, six years now. And other than the traveling part being taken away, mm -hmm. a, a big part of, of what I did was I would travel around the world and go to conferences and right. uh, host workshops and events, teaching about content and social media marketing. And so that was probably the biggest change, but still hosting a lot of events online, still doing uh, publishing articles, publishing videos, publishing webinars, still doing things like this. Yeah. And so that hasn't changed as much. I think the amount of people that attend these online events that are tuning in, that is changing mm -hmm. because people have understood that this virtual atmosphere is going to be permanent to a scale. And so the idea of tuning in live isn't necessarily as important because everyone knows that 
most of the content is going online now. And so if you aren't able to catch it right then and there, you're going to be able to catch it later on YouTube or on a recap blog post or yep. in iTunes for a podcast. So I have noticed a decline in live audience, but a higher view rate afterwards. Huh. That's interesting. I mean, because we, 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 we've known the fractionalized consumer model for a number of years, even 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 you know, going to just the fractionalized cable uh, consumption, right? But now we're in a whole other space is that we are having to meet them, the audience, uh, not only on their preferred method of digital consumption, but when they want it. So the live, yeah, the live certainly ha was a was a value uh, in, in 2019, um, but, but uh, now we're in the repurposing mode and be able to deliver it across all of the different digital lanes, yeah? Exactly, which means a lot more work for me. That's right. That's right. There's a heck of a lot more responsibility there. So that is a topic I want to get to, uh, uh, content uh, uh, repurposing. But before anything else, um, one of the key things that you, that your company focuses on, and I'd like our, our audience to, to understand more, would be content marketing research. Before you get started on any of, of, of the, the topic focus, you've got to understand what you're talking about who you're trying to reach, what the audience's motivation is. So uh, first and foremost, how does one get started uh, developing a, a content research model that they can repeat regularly? Certainly. So I, I think it really comes down to first de defining who your personas are. And sure, that's marketing 101. Mm -hmm. But these days we have so much data to where we can really actually create two to three different kinds of personas that match the exact audience of who's tuning into your content, who's visiting your website, who's going onto your social media pages, and then create content for them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean one content is going to fit all. So before we do a content audit, before we do content creation or even develop a strategy, we first go into the data, we go into Google Analytics, we go into if, um, depending upon, what the client has set up, how long they've had a website or how long they've had a brand presence. We do as much evaluation on the back end to determine who these people are that are engaging with them the most, mm -hmm. as well as who are the people that they're trying to engage with and miss. And then from there, we create multiple personas from them. We then go into, okay, uh, we have persona A, B, and C. Right. Well, B is going to like this kind of content posted on these days the most. But A and C have similarities to where these days are going to work the best for them. But the topics might be different. Mm -hmm. So before we can even dive into creating a content calendar or even really creating the content, we need to have a clear understanding of the different personas to make sure that a brand is constantly reaching both a, B, and C personas at all times. Hmm. Um, and back to our previous uh, point about uh, the, the preferred digital consumption, right? Everybody's got a kind of a, an equalizer bar. Uh, some people may actually like videos a heck of a lot more than podcasts. Some some individuals will like to do research and and, and you know deep diving in content online uh, from their desktop as opposed to mobile. Everybody has their own kind of uh, fingerprint of of, of uh, consumption. So this has actually posed a challenge to user persona creation now because you have that additional um, subset of, of user personas of how they want to consume, right? Exactly. And that's why it's so important to look at the data first, especially when you're developing a persona, to see what the traffic patterns are. Personas A and C may see the product page, mm -hmm. see the deal, and the, the offer that's on the product page or the pop-up that comes up that says buy now for 20% off, that can get them right away. Whereas persona B needs a whole lot more information. They want to watch a video on it. They want to see all the testimonials. They're probably going to go to Google and search a little bit more to find out about your company, mm -hmm. see if there's any other reviews anywhere. So you have to understand that all of the content that you're producing, whether you're hitting personas A and C that can be more immediate mm -hmm. or persona B, you have to create a proper funnel to where you're educating the audience, whether they need the education or not. Hmm. Because personas A and C may already go into there knowing exactly what they need. They're just trying to find the right deal or the right brand at the right price. Right. Where persona B there's no trust yet. They need to be very comfortable with your brand. They definitely need testimonials to, to have that credibility. Understood. 
All right. Well, th th there's a latticing of almost, almost a, 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 a grid system <laughs> that has to be developed to be able to reach each and every persona and be able to plan that those uh, marketing uh, touches uh, when and, and where they want to be uh, connected to. Um, what about research? What about what about um, the, just the market research, not only the personas, and that is a huge foundational factor there, but what about going into what's, what's next on the agenda? Once you've said you've, you've organized your thoughts on the user, what, what's next from a, from a true research uh, process? Uh, unpack some of the uh, possible techniques that you could use. From there, it's literally seeing what's already been done because cool. Just about everything has been done already. So it's taking a look at your competitors. And it's always fun to ask a, a brand or a client, hey, what are your top three to five different competitors? Mm -hmm. And take that, of course, look at those, but then actually go and use tools to see who the real competition is. Simply go into Google, go into a search engine, right. type in the keywords, type in some of the topics to see what's actually populating because they're nine times out of 10, there are stronger competitors out there than who their direct competition is. Absolutely. So always important to go and actually manually see and then also use, there's a plethora of tools that you can use, but uh, to also go in and see who's ranking for this type of content, who is your actual direct competition. And that could be an article that was posted five years ago that's still beating everybody out yep. or an article that was posted a day ago. You need to go in and see what's the structure of that article. What content are they missing? If there's any comments on there of questions that people are asking, those questions can then be pulled in and you wanna make sure your article provides that. Cause at the end of the day, People are going to these competitor sites yep. and getting this because they're getting an answer. And that's all they need is they need to be informed or they need to be entertained. That's what the whole reason you go to Google for and you type something into a search engine. So if your competitors are doing that better than you, even if they're not your direct competitors, you need to understand why they're doing it better. And it's not always just because of brand authority or because they're Forbes and their domain. Right, right, right. right. So the, the, the tried and true methodologies of surveys and focus groups and personal interviews and uh, different field trials for re or research. We're not in that space anymore. We're actually looking at where the conversation well is or the uh, different water coolers that are online. And, and notwithstanding, obviously, we've been in into, into a, an entire digital shift over the last year, but this has been a burgeoning thing for the last decade. So these these old models, while they're still, they still have um, factors of, of value, uh, they need to actually inform the new models of topic research uh, online, right? Certainly. And, and it's not necessarily that the old fashioned market research to where we do study groups is, okay. is long gone. That's still being done by the large corporate players. And that's great that they have the ability to do that and to pull in a variety of people. But for the other 99% of the brands online, that's not realistic. And so the way that we're able to do that now, instead of actually pulling in and doing market research through circles and things like that sure. from golden days, is social media, is literally going to social media and collecting what kind of brand mentions you're getting, what kind of sentiment is being said. I mean, how often do you see a, a brand do a say a story on Instagram right. saying, hey, what kind of content do you want to see more of? They're literally just asking and it's humanizing the brand. Yep. Even big corporate brands are even doing this these days. But that also gives the smaller mom and pop shop an opportunity to still play with the big competitors and understand what the audience wants to see more of or what they want out of content. And, and that's a huge uh, difference now is that people are so forthcoming with with uh, what they want to see and there and they, nobody holds back inside of social media and and blog commentary and and, and what have you um, is there a risk of uh, gravitating too too close to the uh, to the light so to speak of a, a very trending topic or a very uh, well communicated uh, uh, social topic that that uh, maybe isn't the best nuanced topic for your audience. I mean, I mean, there's a gravity pull almost to be able to want to talk about something where everybody is actually talking. So I want to be able to create content that's going to be in that feeding frenzy. 
There's a challenge there because it could very well not align with your brand or the brand's ethics uh, particular, to a particular degree, right? 100%. And not just that, it, content is already saturated. Yeah. And so if you try and join in on a trending topic mm -hmm. and you're already struggling to get on page one for your most popular topics, it, there's no chance you're going to even make it past, past page 10. Hmm. And that's because you're trying to swim in a pool with much, much bigger sharks in there who most likely jumped on the topic first, most likely pulled a resource together that's stronger. So, or, I mean, we saw this with, with COVID, with the first few months of COVID, right. everybody had to talk about COVID from a brand perspective and how it's affecting their company and what their company is doing about it and how they feel about it. <laughs> and that's great because you had to let your customers know how you're repositioning your business model in most cases. But there was a lot of other brands who were trying to capitalize on that trending topic and they just blended in. Everyone was tired of reading about COVID yep. and what your business is doing about it or doing nothing about it. And so then you just fell flat, which then gives your brand a negative outlook. So instead, if, if you have a real reason to join in on a trending and participate in mm -hmm. a trending conversation, uh, my absolute favorite tool, I talk about it 100,000 times, and it's because it's its literally my favorite tool, is SEMrush's topic research tool. It will give you the who, what, when, where, why, how questions that people are asking yep. about a specific topic. So go into there, figure out what questions people are asking about this trending topic that no one's answering. I guarantee you there is always at least a few questions that these trending articles are missing. And that gives you an opportunity to contribute by posting new content about this topic, but in a helpful way that's going to make your, ba your brand actually look positive instead of just blending in. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a fantastic tool, very similar to uh, uh, Answer the Public and, and other, yep. other factors, be able to see the true questions that people are asking. So it's you, you got to, again, kind of stay away from the light, so to speak, um, uh, because it can actually really uh, uh, bruise your brand uh, if it's if if it's being seen as exploitive. And, and obviously, COVID was a lightning rod of that. But we do see the same pattern in a small, smaller trending topics. And the, the, the digital consumer is more savvy to, okay, are you here playing in this in this conversation because you want my business or are you actually authentically contributing uh, uh, good, good, good value for me to consume, right? Yeah. Yep, and with all of Google's recent updates and latest updates, it's all about user experience yeah. and providing actual usefulness to the user. And content has been about that since day one. If you're a brand who mm. publishes entertainment content from the get-go, that's what you focus on. That's always what you should focus on because that's what users are coming to you for. Don't all of a sudden try and publish a black and white article that is just straight facts. It's not going to resonate with your audience. And so that's where Defining the user persona at first comes into play, then looking at what's already been done through that the outside competition, not just direct competitors, right. and then formulating what other value can I add? Very good, very good. Um, all right, so value is is the key pivot here, and um, I wanted to ask a question about establishing business goals for content marketing. Now, one the first part of our conversation is about where the conversation is. You know, and be able to arm yourself with topics and subtopics to be able to 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 participate. But how do you evaluate um, the true goals of content marketing? Um, you know, the the the, the tried well, I shouldn't say tried and true, but the 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 common spaces are sales, right? Uh, mm -hmm. SEO visibility, which is a little bit more removed, but it's intent oriented con content, and then engagement, engagement. Uh, measurements to be able to see how well you're interacting. But uh, what does it all boil down to content mar marketing as it relates to your potential audience? Can you, can you give me that kind of guidance right there? Certainly. So there's a lot of different goals that you can accomplish with content marketing. And depending upon the goal that you're trying to accomplish, specific content types and mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. are going to help you get there the easiest. 
So for example, if you're trying to do sales, sales is the biggest goal of all marketing yep. is you want to convert, you need to get money into the business. So a way to do this through content marketing is to create several different content pieces that guide the user down the sales funnel. Instead of having them get up on get on the phone and go through a bunch of sales departments and sales managers to convert them through there, you only have the opportunity to do that through content. So you need to provide them all the information they need so that they can get comfortable before they convert. And that could be three different blog posts, one of them explaining your processes, mm -hmm. two of them a case study to provide um, more of the credibility of, hey, we've done this before and we know how to do this. And then the third one is, is where you really want to hammer in and actually show exactly what they're going to be getting, what they can expect from this. And that kind of model doesn't always make sense for all brands. There's a lot of brands who offer a service. And so the product aspect isn't there, but you can do the same idea by explaining the service. It's, it's, the old sales funnel model, you need to warm up the audience. And then once you have a really hot audience, you can hit them with the more sales type of content mm -hmm. to actually convert them. You can track this by seeing, are they going in the pattern that, they, that you want them to? Are they going from the infographic on social media that you posted and then going to your website and reading the infographic blog post and then going to the service page afterwards and clicking a consultation form and filling out the form? Mm -hmm. You can track all of those movements and that's ideally what you want them to do. But there's so many different goals that you can accomplish with content marketing and it all comes down to warming up the audience and making sure that they're comfortable through the content that you're publishing. Right. And the, and, and that's a, a very uh, well articulated space of the funnel. My, my next and more riskier question is how do you measure trust? Because in every one of the steps of your journey, you're talking about establishing trust that you're authority in your space, that this mm -hmm. is valuable content value for for that user, that it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, disingenuous, it's not manipulative, it's not exploitive, right? All these all these things that we just talked about. How do you measure trust in the the digital touches that you have with a consumer, given that you have kind of an omni-channel uh, uh, content mar marketing strategy? Mm -hmm. So some of the most obvious ways are brand sentiment. What are people saying about your brand online? Fantastic. Uh, how many backlinks are, are you getting? Are you getting high authority links? Are other high authority websites linking to you? Because then that doesn't just build trust for the search engines. That also builds trust to other users. Absolutely. If I go on to Food Network because I'm looking for a recipe and they quoted this small local food blogger, I'm going to feel like this food blogger knows exactly what they're talking about because Food Network posted them. Hmm. But another way to look at this from like an analytical perspective is to look at your bounce rate. If you have high traffic with a high bounce rate, right. then you're getting the traffic that you need, which is great. Everybody's coming to that piece of content or to that page on your website, but they're bouncing right off. And of course, that could be a thousand different reasons. It could be how it's loading. It could be the way it looks on mobile. It could be the page speed. But more often than not, if all of those can be eliminated, which you can see in metrics by using Google Analytics or losing or uh, Google Search Console or using tools, once those are eliminated, it's then an issue of trust. You've told them that if they go to this page, they can expect X, Y, and Z. And now they go to this page and they're immediately discovering that that is not there. And so you've now lost trust with them and you've missed an opportunity. And that's why they are leaving either your entire website or they're going back and they're trying to find what they were originally promised and they can't find it with you. So whenever you see high traffic mixed with high bounce rate, that can always be an issue of trust. Very good. Very good. How does that transpose into, say, other me other metrics off-site, such as uh, social media or uh, uh, literally any any uh, type of uh, additional content, such as the podcasts or, or uh, videos? How does that actually translate? Because uh, we have smaller sets of metrics to be able to, 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 to watch, right? Yes, certainly. And so... 
everybody is as blunt as can be on social media, especially about your brand. I was actually just having this conversation with my husband the other day that we only leave reviews if we had an amazing experience or an absolutely terrible experience. (laughs) Right. And that's exactly how it is on social media. And that's how it is in the online realm. So being on top of your brand mentions, having a brand tracking tool to where you're always ensuring what the sentiment is being said, especially content. Mm. When you publish a new piece of content, it can definitely rub someone the wrong way and they're going to share that content. You're going to get not the traffic that you're looking for. You may get a lot of traffic to that page, but you're going to have a lot of negative sentiment. You can back that by looking at social media, by tracking where all the brand mentions are coming from. And manually look. A lot of these brand sentiment tools are are fantastic and usually do a good job of if it's actually positive, neutral, or negative Mm -hmm. in terms of prevention. But I always like to take it a step further and do the human approach and actually click through and see who that person was that said that. Go to their profile, see who they follow, see who follows them. To have a real clear idea of what this brand mention actually means for my brand yep. and what the reach is. And then stalk them and actually come to their door, right? Yes, exactly. No. If oh. possible, publicly. <laughs> well, actually, you know you know what? Uh, Gary V actually wrote the Thank You Economy uh, a while back. And there's a number of stories uh, of reaching out to that individual. Right? And there was a per- great story uh, he had about a uh, guy that was buying wine and he was putting putting together a wine purchase. He, uh, his team found out that he was a Jets fan and they got him a Jets T-shirt or a Jets jersey, and uh, the guy that would regularly buy a three hundred dollar uh, order of wine, he bought like four thousand dollars that year. Now that's that's granular thank you kind of uh, connections. The inverse is also uh, very valuable. If a brand, if if a consumer can see that the brand cares so much that they're actually reaching out and saying. How was your experience, right? And we've talked about this with review responses and making sure that that not only do people see the brand response, but finding a way to make their their experience better, right? And, and finding where that commentary is actually happening, either on other blog content blogs or in social or on reviews, that sets a whole pursuit vector of 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 learning from your consumer audience because that actually can also trickle back into your organization as a whole because customer service may not even be learning from from the content marketing or the the brand sentiment right so plugging those wires together can can certainly improve the entire organization sorry i got on the rant there but uh, that's <laughs> that's that's that's, sure. what, that's what you're talking about um i i, I do i am very intrigued about how to measure trust. Uh, do you have any recommendations on tools that are stellar at brand sentiment analysis? Certainly, uh, Mention is a fantastic tool. Um, I, I'm i inside of SEMrush every day, and so their brand sentiment tool, it's really easy because I'm already in there doing content work, and then I can just go over, and it's tracking for my domains, mm-hmm. for my brand names, and it gives me the positive, negative, neutral, um, but mention is also a fantastic tool. There's also brand watch. There's so many of them these days. So it really comes down to what your current tool arsenal is yep. and how you want to expand that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, actually, we certainly appreciate you kind of breaking down how to how to measure these goals. And, and that is part and parcel of every content strategy that you put together and all the different tactics. You got to know how to actually measure them and and as a collective uh, uh, as opposed to just the individual tactics and their behavior i mean there's there's that there's the uh, the, the the holistic perspective of how a campaign is actually running as well right Certainly. Uh, so we talked a, a good deal about um, uh, uh, creating a content marketing research process as well as how to evaluate the business goals and how to create the business goals uh, for content marketing. Now, there's a there's another another step to this equation of how you can create a successful content marketing uh, strategy and uh, tactic ensemble, and that's the the efficient reuse of of content marketing. Um, before anything, what is content reuse? Can you explain that for us? Certainly. So it's taking a piece of content that has already been published mm-hmm. and recycling it. So whether you're taking, let's take a blog post for example, sure. it was published 
Last year, it's about how to do holiday marketing and you are prepping for your 2021 Q4 calendar and you want to do another version of holiday marketing. Mm -hmm. Instead of reinventing the reel, you can take bits and pieces from that original blog post and either create social media graphics from callouts. You can do audio bites inside of it. You basically just repurpose what the original piece of content was and you can either update it, you can recycle it into a new content medium. Mm -hmm. I mean, the possibilities are, are really endless when it comes to reusing your content. All right. So it's, it's, it's not only the content, it's the topic matter. And is it also, um, you're not just repurposing it verbatim, you're actually dialing it in based on uh, consumer uh, or the, the, the consumer's preference, right? So uh, turning something from a long form into a short form, and that's the most, the most uh, general concept there. But it's, it's really uh, kind of getting into all of the different nuances, all the digital lanes, right? And not only just digital, obviously, but um, uh, what are some of the challenges there? And more importantly, when should you not repurpose content? Certainly. So as far as challenges, it it's very time consuming yeah. to repurpose content. And argumentatively, creating a new piece of content can be just as much time as repurposing a piece of content, mm -hmm. but it depends on how you do it. So for example, you can take a webinar that you do. You then take the webinar, you upload it to YouTube, you have the video going. So even if those didn't attend live, they're able to see it. You take the video from YouTube, you embed it into a blog post. You use a blog post to dive even deeper into the topic. Mm -hmm. Because let's be honest, every webinar, every podcast, we we go deep, but there's so much more on a topic. And that goes with blog posts as well. Mm -hmm. So then you can use the text opportunity to dive even deeper to make sure you're answering all the questions, covering everything there is to know about that topic. And you still have the original content in there, which is the webinar video from YouTube as well. So in terms of difficulty, it, it it's just, it's a time consuming standpoint. Um, it is nice that you don't have to come up with a brand new topic, but you do need to measure and understand what other points of this topic were not covered that go. need to be covered. And that's where the time consuming aspect can also come in. So once you have that dialed in, then you can repurpose content all day because you know exactly why you need to repurpose this content and what you need to dive in more mm -hmm. or clarify. Excellent. I understand. Um, and, and I appreciate you looking at it from that nu that nuance because you certainly don't want to repurpose the same bullet points again and again and again uh, in, in different delivery me mechanisms because uh, you could certainly hurt your brand if it, it just looks like it's um, a copy of a copy of a copy and just just uh, uh, sending it out there into the, into the digital lanes, right? A hundred percent. And it... it it not only just negatively reflects your brand, but it's not going to do anything for you. And, and you do take the time to still replicate that kind of content, but no one's looking for replicated content. They can type in the same question inside of Google and get 20 other articles or 20 other brands and sites that are listing the same information because these days, a lot of the time, mm -hmm we have the top few search results that are generally unique. And then everything underneath of that is taken from those articles, good old fashioned journalism research, sure. see what's already been published and repackage it in your own way. Well, that's not going to get you traffic. That's not going to get you conversions and that's not going to satisfy user intent. Yep. 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 So we have a whole nother mousetrap now in digital is we can actually measure the performance. We can measure that, that individual and be able to, as, as they go to a particular blog page or a content page, we can remarket with that next level of information and content so we can further the conversation as opposed to repurposing it and they, they can get tone deaf because it looks exactly the same as what they've experienced. Uh, so there's an articulation opportunity there. Uh, and again, we talk buyer's journey, user personas, there's the entire lattice thing, and then you have the, the different mediums so that all these uh, these pieces of the topic can can uh, uh, be uh, uh cut up into sushi into little little bits to be able to deliver right when should there not be a a uh, use a reuse of content marketing or is or should there ever be uh, a stop point should you always be trying to do that it 
it's a, li- a little bit complicated. I'm not going to say the big SEO word and, and I'm not going <laughs> to say it. Da-da. But it, it's complicated because it, it comes back to measuring. In, in both instances, if a content that you've published has done really poorly, mm-hmm. You should still republish that because you obviously missed something. You didn't connect. You didn't provide the right information. Right. It, you didn't package it correctly. So that's where I recommend repurposing because lots of times it's the content medium or the information provided. So if you did it as a blog post at first, mm-hmm. do it as a video the next time and address more questions or provide more information. There you go. The same goes if your content did really well. Why touch it if it did so well? But what if you haven't even really hit the tip of the iceberg with that piece of content? If you have a topic that's trending and that you have, say you have like three articles and this is the reason you're found in search engines and why you have all this traffic and brand recognition is because of these three articles. Well, great. Do them more. Do those articles more. Do those topics more. Whether it was a um, a short form blog post or a long form blog post, or it had a sentence at the top, five bullet points, five paragraphs, and an image. Whatever you did on those three pieces of content that did absolutely amazing, right. do that again and either change the topic or go go at it with a different angle. And this is where, again, you can use SEMrush's topic research tool to see what other questions are being asked. And you can also see the top 10 trending articles for that topic or keyword. So go see what everybody else is doing to see how you can repurpose this just a little bit differently. Absolutely. And that all presupposes that you're measuring it correctly. So you got to know how to actually measure whether it actually drops like a thud or it skyrockets. And some some metrics are are better than others to actually know that the topic is engaging. But but uh, and we talked about this before is, is being able to start start with a topic. You have a lot of additional subtopics that absolutely should find its way into into relevancy and connection with your main content marketing piece. So if you plan ahead for repurposing, right? And again, there's a discipline there, but if you plan ahead for this, um, it kind of writes itself in a way, in a weird way, it, it based on where it's going to be delivered, what type of medium. I mean, for example, if you start with a blog post, right, you've got imagery from the blog post and you've got quote graphics and infographics and instru- well, infographics are a whole nother conversation, but <laughs> <laughs> I won't gloss over that. But like in structural images and header images and stat graphics, all those can be then moved into the into the social ecosystem for a trail back to the to the uh, to the destination. That's content repurposing, right? A hundred percent. And and I, I love that you brought it up like this because I always recommend to audit your content quarterly. You don't have to do a full blown in-depth huge audit on your content. You can do that once a year. Mm-hmm. But Every quarter, you should be measuring the content performance of the previous quarter Hmm. so that you know what to do in the next quarter. And by doing that, you're going to be able to pull out what performed great, what didn't perform that well, and how can I... more so, what stance should I should I take with these sets of articles that did really well and didn't perform? Should I update the ones that didn't do that well and dive a little bit deeper? Should I repackage them? And then the ones that did great, should I then go turn them into infographics or go. many social media snippets? Or clearly they did great for a specific reason, and that's where looking at the data comes in. So if you audit your content quarterly, you're always going to know what to do in the next quarter. And that's not reinventing the wheel here. That's looking at what you've already done and seeing how can you refine it even further instead of just publishing another new blog post once a week and cross your fingers. Absolutely. And and we forget about that, the 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 uh, the value of a content update on that page and being able to send the same traffic back uh, with with that additional value. Uh, you, you enjoyed that blog content. We've just updated it with this, this, and this. Now you're, even, you're again, creating better and better value and trust to the users because you're actually uh, watering that garden. You're, you're, you're taking care of it and you're, you're uh, creating a better value for them to come back to your site or your different digital uh, communication points because they know they're going to get more information, right? A hundred percent. All right. I got, I, I got another question. What about slide share decks? Um, I've always been on the fence regarding those. 
I, I, I don't know how you measure bloody performance on those things. And it just seems like it's a, it's an afterthought type of, okay, we did all this and hey, there's another medium right there. Let's go put all of our content into that. How do those perform? Are they valuable? What, what are your thoughts there? I think nowadays, if you ask anybody, if they actually go to SlideShare to get information, right. you have a really small percentage. And so instead, I would use that space. If, if you're going to create a deck style piece of content, post it on your blog, post it on your own site, post it on your own site. Um, you can measure SlideShare still drives traffic to sites. By all means, I'm not saying it doesn't. And if you're posting a SlideShare, stop doing. No, go in and see how much traffic you're getting from SlideShare. And if you're getting a significant amount, especially if you're getting more than your blog, your sure, blog yeah. getting them by all means, keep going on SlideShare. But if you're not, if you've never done SlideShare, don't start now. Now is definitely <laughs> not the time to like get into SlideShare. Instead, take that content and post it on your own website. Put some um, some uh, Facebook ad money towards it. Five bucks a day. Boost it for about ten days, so you have a heavy flow of traffic going through there, and then you're good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's what I wanted to hear. If if you haven't done it, don't do it. Yeah, it, I, I think it's kind of a uh, what do you say? It's the uh, the old dogs are still betting on that. <laughs> But, yeah, exactly. But if, if you're going to, if you're playing the betting game when it comes down to content marketing, uh, move your chips to another number. Uh, and I'm not even going to talk about ebooks because those things are just scary vortexes of of <laughs> unnecessary effort, I guess. Uh, but but is is there too much repurposing? Is there a thing as too much content repurposing? There is because you don't want the whole next quarter of your content to just be updating or repurposing sure. the content that you did the previous quarter. You need to still have unique content. There's still tons of questions that are being asked by your target demographic. There's information or entertainment that they are specifically looking for yep. that you have yet to provide and that either your competition or the online competition is already providing or there is a gap. Very rarely do I ever find these gaps of something that hasn't been done before. Very, very rarely, but it does happen. So don't repurpose every single piece of your content. Definitely look at what is doing the worst and what is doing the best and start there. Very good. I'll run through a couple quick uh, points of just uh, examples of repurposing, turning a blog post into a podcast, uh, uh, inter internal data into case studies, blog content into video content, uh, content and possibly going to an ebook. Yeah, it's kind of scary, but hey, slide decks, shot, slide shares. We kind of said, you know what? Then let's move away from that. Testimonials into social content, oh, blog posts into new information, statistics into social media content. There's a there's a bandolier of things that you can do uh, for with the content that you currently have. Um, but let's talk about successful tracking. And with the time that we have left uh, with you, tracking successful content marketing, uh, repurposing strategies and marketing strategies themselves, what are some of the tools and what are some of the signals that you should be paying attention to that you, you've hit that sweet spot? It didn't fall like a thud. Um, I mean, there's some general metrics that we all know, but um, can you give us some some uh, pointers on how to how to hear uh, the tone correctly? Did we reach our consumers? Certainly. So time on page is an amazing metric. That's generally what people are going to go to first. And it's a great metric, but it, it has to be com combined with other metrics because mm -hmm. How often do you find yourself opening up an article or you got an email newsletter coming through from one of the many blogs that you're subscribed to, mm -hmm. you open the page, you start scrolling with it a little bit, and then you get a call or you get up to go get your coffee, you're still on that page and you come back 10 minutes later and you're scrolling through, that really messes up the time on page insights. Absolutely. Yep. And so if you have a lot of traffic, that's great, but you also need to double check that with time on page and with things like heat mapping to see, did they get to the third paragraph and just stop for five minutes? They're definitely not reading it for five minutes. So heat mapping tools are fantastic to see how your content is actually being digested. Good, yeah. Uh, lots of traffic is great, but if you have a high bounce rate too, like we talked about earlier, then that's not a good combination. You're not providing what the user was actually looking for. So there's, there's tons of metrics 
to measure your content. There's very simple metrics to measure your content, but they need to go hand in hand. Just because you have a lot of social shares mm -hmm. doesn't mean you actually got traffic from those social shares. Gotcha. So it, there's a lot of variations there. Understood, understood. One point of clarity that I'd like to ask you, are you a an ROI content marketer or an ROO content marketer, return uh, on objective? Hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say the, the, the it blah, blah, blah word, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. it depends. It depends. It really does. It, it depends on... on I guess it, it depends on the objective more than anything else right. because content has a longer life cycle to actually get the conversion than things like advertising does or things like organic traffic. And so with content, it, it's really warming about the audience and bringing them down the funnel. And so if you can accomplish one of the objectives to get them down the funnel, then that's a win in my book. There you go. There you go. Hey, I want to be respectful for your time. I know you're about to take a break here. Uh, I do want to ask you, what excites you about your industry right now? Right now, the fact that the whole world is online. We've always been online as <laughs> online marketers, but now the whole world is online. Yeah. And so everybody's consuming content more than ever before, they're consuming various types of content and the metrics are totally changing. Long form content works, short form content works. Wow. Uh, one minute videos are doing fantastic on social media and 20 minute videos are doing fantastic on YouTube. So this is just a really interesting time because all the metrics that we thought we could kind of count on are literally just thrown up in the air right now and yep. we're all we're taking this day by day to see how each day users are interacting with content. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Would you like to leave our digital marketing audience any final thoughts about content marketing today? Certainly. Keep creating. Never stop creating and only create what your users will actually like. Don't create for Google. Uh, but we all have a friend in Google, right? <laughs> we have a friend in in answering questions that users put inside of Google. There you go. There you that's go. where Google comes in and connects us together with them. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, so is there anything that we can promote for you today? Uh, just Top Hat content. If there's anything else I can help provide, you can reach me at ashley at tophatcontent.com. All right, so thank you so much, Ashley. We're gonna cut you loose so you can get to your other webinar. Thanks so much for joining us on, this, on a second interview. Don't be a stranger. We certainly wanna have you come back around uh, in an, another year or so. How about that? Perfect. Sounds great. Thank All right. you so much. Good luck to you and thanks so much. Appreciate it. You want to make sure you track uh, Ashley now on our Twitter handle at Ashley Mad Hatter. That's really, really cool, actually. That's a fantastic <laughs> handle. Uh, on Facebook at Top Hat Rank. Uh, and is it also fa Facebook Top Hat Content as well? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, no, I'm sorry, just Top Hat Rank. Got it, got it. And uh, over on LinkedIn, Ashley Ward uh, 90 as well, because that's where I knew you from. So. <laughs> <laughs> Again, congratulations on the marriage, and thanks so much for contributing yeah. today, and uh, best of luck in everything you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate you're it. You're more than welcome. All right. Edge of the Web is brought to you by Site Strategics, our title sponsor, and thanks to them. Don't forget to like, subscribe uh, to Edge of the Web on YouTube, and if you're really feeling up to it today, drop us a quick review on iTunes as well. Again, thanks to our title sponsor, Site Strategics. Be sure to check out all the must-see videos and much more over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, next week, our next interview is going to be uh, Pedro Diaz, so you want to make sure that you check that out as well. Uh, from all of us over at Edge of the Web, be safe, be well, and do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. We'll talk to you next week. Bye -bye.